Good morning and happy Sabbath. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I'm gonna need a little bit of help this morning, though, because my energy levels have actually been a little low lately. So I, I'm gonna need a little more oomph in that this morning to really help get me going. All right. So happy Sabbath. All right. God is good. All the time. All right. We're good. All right. We're good. We're ready to go. Um, so I've been doing something this week um, that is often known as doom scrolling. Um, I don't know if any of you know what that is. Um, doom scrolling is where, especially on social media, uh, you go looking at all the things that you really don't want to look at, like for example, what's going on in the world around you. And so I have been steeped in places like Haiti, in Yemen, Somalia, Syria, and then Ukraine, and, and seeing all of these stories and all of these, these hopeful things, but a lot of horrible things along the way. Um, and part of the problem is when you doom scroll too much, uh, it gets really easy uh, to lose sight of hope. Uh, when you doom scroll too much, it's really easy to get caught up in what's going on around you. And then here I am uh, sitting in my living room just looking at my phone and feeling powerless and helpless. Like there's nothing I can do to help what's going on right now. All I can do is watch. Um, and that's hard. And, that, and, and, it, and it's, it's not good to get stuck in that place. But I'll tell you right now, I am thankful for two things this morning. First, I am thankful for the community of God, especially the one found here at Temple City. Because when I come here, I know that I am not alone. And we know that we are not alone. We also know that Christ is alive and well and moving and working in the world around us. Because when I see this community of faith, I'm reminded of other community of faith, community of faith that span uh, the entire globe. We also have the word of God. And I love it for two reasons. One, because it reminds us that communities of faith and people of God throughout history have gone through similar things and similar times and similar contexts and have made it through. But also because the words point us to a reality far greater than ourselves, a God far greater than we could even imagine, a God who loves us and cares about us, and saves us. And so it is that hope that I come into this text, and today I hope to share uh, some hope and perhaps some warning in the words of Daniel 5. But first, pray with me one more time. Father in heaven, Lord, we are surrounded by beastly systems. We've been surrounded by beastly systems, and we know they're only going to get even more beastly before you return. But Lord, may you give us hope and may you give us peace as we face what comes. Speak, Lord, we're listening. Amen. Amen. So we've been in the book of Daniel and we've been talking about Nebuchadnezzar for quite some time now because Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon uh, throughout the, the beginning of the book of Daniel. Uh, and actually, last week, last, in our last chapter of Daniel, in Daniel 4, we actually see a turnaround on the part of Nebuchadnezzar. After Nebuchadnezzar has a mental break that has been given to him because of his pride, because of his hubris, uh, Nebuchadnezzar actually says, you know what, God, I'm really sorry. I disrespected you. I'm really sorry for all the flexing and the fronting. I'm really sorry for offending you. And let's just be cool, okay? Okay. But we also have to remember all that happened before that. What led us to where Nebuchadnezzar got? And you see, because Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, he had a dream about a statue, and then Daniel uh, showed up and told him about the statue. And talked about the head of gold and said, hey, that's you. And he's like, hey, that's great. Gold is good. Gold is precious. Gold is beautiful. I like it. And then he goes, oh, yeah, but there's going to be these other metals that represent other kingdoms that come. And he's like, oh, no, nope, nope, I don't like that. I don't want any of that. And so that's why we see him create a whole statue out of gold. He's like, nah, Babylon's going to last forever. 
My legacy will be forever. And if anyone disagrees with me, I'm going to throw them in the furnace. We have to remember that Babylon is a beastly system and that even though Nebuchadnezzar might have had a conversion moment, the system that he is operating in, the system that he is running is a beastly system. Babylon came in to Israel. Babylon destroyed the temple. Babylon took the people into captivity. Babylon scattered them around the empire. That's why we call it the diaspora. Because he scattered them because you don't want to have an uprising. Well, you won't have an uprising if too many people from the same cultural group are together. So if you scatter them all over the place, it's less likely that you'll have an uprising on your hands. So Babylon scattered and separated families in the process. And then Babylon said, hey, they got smart, capable people here, so let's take them and let's make them work for us. Let's take them and take them captive and make them do our work for us. And yeah, sure, they might have treated them nice and they might have had the palace all nicely decorated, but if you can't leave, a prison is still a prison, no matter how nicely decorated it is. Then, after Nebuchadnezzar's reign, comes King Belshazzar. Now, as often happens with uh, ancient kings and also what happens in modern-day systems, the son comes in and decides just to double down on everything the dad did. The son comes in and goes, hey, you thought, you thought that was something. Just you wait and see what I'm going to do. So despite Nebuchadnezzar's moment, despite his conversion experience, Belshazzar comes in, and one of the, fir- the first and last thing we see this king do when he gets into power is he throws a party, and he starts to flex. So what he does is he gets drunk, and he's like, hey, we raided the temple, we destroyed the temple, why don't we bring out all their cool stuff? Why don't we bring out all their gold and all their silver and all their fancy ornaments and their fancy cups? I don't even know what this stuff does. I don't care, let's bring it out. And then I got a great idea, because he's got all of his friends around him, he's got all of the like, loyal leaders to him, like, he's got a thousand people hanging out with him. He's like, hey, let, let's really turn this party up. But what we're going to do is we're going to start drinking wine out of these ornaments from this temple. And we're going to start praising the gods of iron and gold and wood and bronze and all this stuff. This sounds like a great time. So the party gets turned up. They're drinking wine out of the sacred ornaments of God, out of the sacred things of God. And then a hand from out of nowhere starts writing on the wall. Now, I don't know about you, um, I think in any state of mind that would terrify me if all of a sudden and I, like a hand starts writing on the wall. And so understandably, King Belshazzar might have sobered up real quick, and King Belshazzar is definitely terrified about what's going on. So similar to his father before him, he calls in all the sorcerers and all the magicians and all of those people that are supposed to know what they're doing and says, guys, I need you to tell me what this says. And none of them are able to. And so he goes, uh, and then the queen goes, hey, there's this guy named Daniel, I remember, and and this guy was able to interpret things, so why don't we bring him in and have him interpret the words on the wall? Now, I want to take a moment here. Power is a funny thing. And as the old saying goes, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I think we see it very plain here, but at the same time, what's interesting is that power causes uh, people to become incredibly proud and incredibly arrogant, but also incredibly paranoid. The saying goes, heavy lies the crown, is because when you are holding the power, you are on top, you're constantly looking around you, afraid that people are going to try to knock you off that. Why? Because this sort of power is not sustainable. And if your base is built on exploitation and exploiting and marginalizing and oppressing people, that is not sustainable. The king always has to watch the king's back. The king hires people, bodyguards and food testers and and all of this stuff to keep him safe because there are always eyes on him trying to take him off his seat of power. 
Honestly, that's probably how Belshazzar got into his position in the first place, was waiting for a moment of weakness from his pops and then sliding on in there. So Daniel comes up before the king. And he goes, hey, aren't you this Daniel guy that was brought out of Judah? So like King Belshazzar is no fool. King Belshazzar remembers and knows what they did, what Babylon did to the people of Judah, and that Daniel is a result of this. And then he goes, hey, anyone that can solve this, and he goes to Daniel, if you could tell me what this says, I will give you position, I'll give you power, I'll give you wealth, I'll give you all these things if you can just tell me what it says. And I love Daniel's response. He says, let your gifts be for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. I'm going to tell you what it says, but you can keep all that stuff because, because Daniel has proven time and time again, he doesn't want anything to do with the rewards or honors that this kingdom can lavish because it is empty, it is shallow, and it is built on exploitation and oppression. And Daniel says, no, nah, thanks. You can keep the accolades, you can keep the honors, you can keep that stuff, but I'm gonna tell you what it says. And you might wanna hold on to that anyways because you might not like what I have to say. Because every time a beastly system is in place, God raises up a prophetic voice to speak out against it. Let me say that again. Every time there is a beastly power in play, every time an empire rises, and even if that empire goes by the name of Israel, God raises up a prophetic voice to hold it in check, to hold it in balance, and to speak out against it when need be. So in our text for today, he goes like, let me tell you a little history, Belshazzar. Let me tell you a little story about your pops. Let me tell you a story about your dad. Let me tell you how things went with him. Because you and he are actually a lot alike. And he's like, he thought he could do, do this too. He thought his power made him invincible. He thought all of the stuff that he had was going to protect him. And then there he was out in the fields, wandering around like an animal for quite some time hair growing all along and looking weird and shaggy. He's like, and then he saw the light. And he goes, but you, Belshazzar, you knew this. You saw this happen. You saw what happened to your father and you chose to go the opposite way. You chose to double down on what your dad did before instead of learning from your dad's mistakes. Babylon could have been something different under you, Belshazzar, if you had just taken the lesson and learned and grown from it, if you had changed the way you did things, if you stopped oppressing the people, you could have done something beautiful. But in verse 23, you've exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. The vessels of his temple have been brought in before you and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. You have misused the things of God, the God you saw working in this empire before. You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose power is your very breath. And I love the way the text says that. God is not a God of things. God is not a God of structures or buildings. God is not a God uh, of these resources that we have, useful as they may be. God isn't in those things. God is the God of your very breath. Every time wind passes through your lungs, you are reminded that God is there. And to whom belong all your ways, you have not honored. So from his presence, the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Many, many tekel and parson. And this is the interpretation of the matter. Many, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. You're done. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Nothing gold can stay. And now your time has come to say goodbye. 
tackle. You have been weighed and measured and found wanting because God sees what you're doing. God knows what you're doing. God knows it. God hears the cries of the people crying out in oppression because our God is the God of the marginalized and the oppressed. And do not forget this fact, beloved. Our God is the God of the marginalized and the oppressed. When Jesus rolls up into Nazareth after the temptations, when Jesus delivers his inaugural address, he says, let me tell you right now, right off from the bat, what God is about. God is about liberation for those that are in bondage. God is about giving sight to the blind. God is about helping the poor wherever they may be found. This is what God is about And when your system, when your kingdom is not about that, you're found wanting. And and Parson, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. The first thing I want to say this morning is a message of hope. Psalms 147 verses 10 to 11 says this. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of a runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. God doesn't like power plays. God doesn't like weird flexes. God doesn't like it when that's not what God is here and what God is about. This power thing that we are all oftentimes so caught up with and so obsessed with and and many of us desire so much, God wants nothing to do with that. God doesn't even want our churches to be like that. We see it in the case of the church called Mars Hill, uh, the one with, with Driscoll. And how this seemingly powerful church empire that was seemingly making all these big changes and big moves and bringing all these people to Christ, and isn't this great for the kingdom of God, collapses because it was built on power and built on the idea of gaining power. That's not what the way of God is. Pleasure comes in reverence and awe and wonder. It comes in hope. It comes in steadfast, stubborn love that just won't let go. In the things that the world sees weak, that is what God loves. And that is where we find true strength. So this morning, I want to start with a message of hope. In, in the light of our Putins, in the light of our, our fascism that's rising up in, in systems around the, the world, even in our own system here. A word of hope. The reason why the statue had so many medals is because those kingdoms are not sustainable and those kingdoms will not last. Russia seems incredibly strong, but Russia is not stronger than the Lord. Russia may seem long-lasting and Putin might seem to never age, but you know what? He is aging and he will not last forever. And when your whole system is built on oppressing people beneath you, history has proven time and time again, and we're seeing this in the actions of the Ukrainians time and time again. People, when they've had enough, they will stand up and they will say no. And right now, the whole world is coming together, and it is saying no. Those systems will not last. And remember, in the the, the dream of the statue, we see the rock not hewn by human hands. It comes and smashes the feet of the statue, and the whole thing comes crumbling down because the last word belongs to the Lord. We know that there will be turbulence along the way. We know that there will be wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and famines and plagues and all sorts of things. We know that, but our hope is not in any of those things. Our hope is in the Lord God. And he will not disappoint. Even when they misuse the things of God. Even when we see Christian churches partner with these beastly systems, like some aspects of the Lutheran church with the Third Reich and some elements of the Russian Orthodox church, especially the patriarch, all but blessing Putin's efforts, those systems will not last either. 
Because when you dance with the devil, there's only one uh, conclusion to that. But this morning, church, I I also want us to have a word of warning to go along with this hope. Because I want us to to share in this cautionary tale. Any system can become a beastly system. Let me say that one more time. Any system can become a beastly system. Even church systems can fall prey to the temptations of wealth and power and control. Even churches can misuse the things of God. If you use scripture as a weapon of hatred and ignorance, you have misused the things of God. When you've turned the sanctuary, a place whose very meaning is refuge and safety and shelter, and you make it an unsafe place, You have misused the things of God. When traditions are more important than people, when the way someone looks on the outside is more important than the way they look on the inside, you have misused the things of God. It's easy to fall into, and it's tempting. And you might have all the right reasons And you might have cherry-picked your scriptures to back you up. But I'll tell you right now, we need to be very careful not to misuse the things of God. Because that pride, that hubris, many churches have done that. And very similar to Babylon, the writing was on the wall for them too. Their days were numbered. They were weighed, and they were measured, and they were found wanting. And their kingdom was taken from them and given to someone else. We have to remember who God is and not who we want God to be. Oftentimes, the temptation is once God created us in God's image, we want to create God in our image. We want God to look a certain way, to act a certain way, to think a certain way, to love certain people and hate certain people because that's what we do. But we have to remember that God is bigger than all of us. And the second you start doing that, you limit God. And when we limit God, we fall prey to our own hubris and pride. So many churches ask the question, why aren't our young people here anymore? Many churches ask the question, why can't we get people to come? Why can't we get people to volunteer? Why why aren't they just showing up? Because when you have oppressed people long enough and you have hurt people enough, there always comes a point where they will say no. And they will say not anymore. So that's a challenge for us this morning, Temple City, because we have a system here. And for the most part, it's a beautiful system. I see many that have come up through the church and that are actively still involved in the church that have grown up and they they have not departed from the ways that you have taught them. Yeah, it is a blessing. Amen that. Yeah, amen and hallow you. Yeah, absolutely. Applause and clap that. Celebrate that. Absolutely. Because there are so many churches now that are empty of those people because they've been hurt too much by those churches. But let it also serve as a warning. We always must be looking at God first. We always must be looking at Christ, the perfecter and sustainer of our faith. And we must always be willing to put aside our own pride and put aside our traditions and put aside our stuff because our stuff is great. But remember, God is not in the stuff. That's the gods of metal and wood and iron and bronze and stone. And we don't care about those because they're not real. The God of our very breasts is our reality. Everything else has to be flexible. Christ is our only absolute. 
Christ is who we follow, and we do what Christ did. And we do what Christ does. These systems won't last. Russia doesn't stand a chance, because Russia is standing against the God of the cosmos. It will fail, and it will fall. And any other system that tries to rise up before God comes back will meet the same fate. And beloved, this morning, let us cling to that hope as we do what we can to help, as we send aid to the Ukrainians, but also let's not forget the other places in the world that are suffering too. Places like Yemen and Somalia and Syria and Haiti. I know the Ukrainian, the Ukraine's really flashing. It's right there in front of our faces and it's really easy to get caught up in that, but that's not the only place that's suffering. So let us do what we can for this world that is so broken and so hurting and groaning out in labor pains for the return of Jesus. And yes, we know where it's all going to go. We know this hope that burns within our hope, hearts, the hope in the coming of the Lord. We know that this will come when Christ returns in the clouds of glory and the sky unrolls like a scroll. We, we know this. But in the meanwhile, let's show this. In the meanwhile, let's live that victory in the world around us today. Comfort each other with these words.